Welcome to HCI. Welcome to another event of Friday Morning Coffee. Uh, organizational Solutions. We're really excited to have everybody here. Um, we've got some really good feedback on this topic. Uh, I appreciate everybody who's online watching. I uh, want to do a quick introduction, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Jen and our panel today. We have with us Mr. Harvey Jessup. Uh, he is the Program Manager of the Office of OSHA Voluntary Programs. He joined OSHA as a Compliance Officer in 1990, worked for two years before, becoming, uh, before coming to the Office of OSHA Voluntary Programs. Uh, during this time with OVP, he's inspected over a thousand workplaces and a wide variety of manufacturing facilities. In 2008, he became the manager of the office. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Biology from USC and is a certified public manager. I will skip down to the far end to Mr. Randy Adams, a man I know well. He is with ZF Industries. He is the head of safety, security, and environmental for North American ZF Industries. Uh, he has assisted 46 sites in achieving OSHA's BPP star site status, all on first audit. Uh, he is an officer in OSHA's Region 4 BPP Participant Association for the last three years. And then in the middle, last but not least, Phil McCray has played a number of roles in human resources over the years, quality HR training and development, uh, and also HSC. His most recent role is Senior Manager of Health, Safety, and Environmental uh, for Facilities at Honeywell. He has a BA degree from Winthrop and his uh, Master's in Human Resource Development from Clemson. He's also a Senior Professional in Human Resources. Uh, we're gonna, we have some great discussion going on today. Uh, for you Twitter heads out there, hashtag OSFMC, hashtag OSHA. So talk about us. We want to get more people involved. Uh, but Jen? Right. Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us. We've got a great panel um, today. I met, um, actually, I met Randy just this morning, but um, I've known Phil for quite some time, and I met Harvey a couple years ago when um, I went to an ocean inspection with my previous employer. Um, so I thought this morning we would start with um, just the fundamentals, foundations of, of OSHA. So I thought maybe Harvey could share uh, who administers OSHA and, um, and how, is it, how is it funded and how is it structured in South Carolina? Um, in South Carolina, we have a, a state plan state, and there are state plan states in 26 um, states and growing. Um, as you may or may not know, federal OSHA does not cover public sector. Um, state plan states do cover public sector employees, and so a lot of states that are currently um, federal states, Indiana is one, um, New York just um, started their public program. They've, they've put in a uh, kind of a state branch. They're still, most of it is still under federal control, <clears throat> but to cover public employees, they have put in their state, you know, um, OSHA. And there are uh, maybe one state that's trying to get full um, state plan status, but most of that went on in the early years of OSHA. So either either the state runs it or the federal folks run it. Now there's still in those state plan states, there's still a small contingent of federal folks who cover um, federal installations, um, army bases, the not the soldiers on army bases, but the um, private you know contractors and stuff like that on army bases. They cover um, anything over a navigable waterway and and then we have memorandums of understanding for other things like um, any nuclear sites and things like that, nuclear power sites, that is. Um, so uh, there's a small contingent of federal folks even in these state plan states. But um, uh, under the state plan states, it's, it's covered under different you know, parts of, of the government. In South Carolina, it's covered under the Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. Um, it used to be on its own, but um, 10 years ago, or maybe longer than that now, when they consolidated it, um, they put a lot of organizations, the uh, professional occupational licensing, all under labor licensing and regulation. So that's how we work. Um, we are funded um, with help from the state and from the federal government. Federal government kicks in for the compliance side or enforcement side, they kick in 50% of the money. For my side, um, for the consultation side, they kick in 90% of the money, and the state kicks in 10%. Um, and what else? Um, do you, um, something when we spoke, um, just kind of planning for today, you had mentioned that um, 
that South Carolina penalties are some of the lowest in the nation, okay, which, some of the difference which surprised that. me. I, right. was, I was shocked by that. So how, how is that, that we have some of the lowest penalties? Um, as, as a state plan state, we are tasked to be as effective as the um, federal OSHA. And what that means is, is um, actually it doesn't mean anything because the, the, even the federal folks don't have a, a definition of effectiveness for themselves. So they can hardly <laughs> put a definition of effectiveness on, effectiveness on us. So that gives us a lot of leeway. And um, uh, what we do is we, we set forth our, our plan um, and the federal folks come in and they're supposed to say, all right, you are, you are doing what you are saying. We've, we've approved your plan as being as effective as, and now we come in and, and they look at us about once every, you know, four or five years um, to make sure that we are following our plan or that's what they're supposed to do. Um, in recent years, they've kind of gotten down to trying to make us exactly like Federal Ocean and all the states have fought that and, and we've won pretty successfully with that. So they're going back to the old system of just looking at our plans that have been approved and saying, yes, you are, you are following your procedures and plans that you've put in place. Um, we do have to adopt any new um, OSHA regulations and things like that um, that, that come down the, the pipe. But um, other than that, we're, we're pretty free within some parameters um, to uh, do the program as we like. And one of those in recent years, the, the federal um, folks, and, and you have to understand that just like every other government agency, um, OSHA changes with a change in administration. So, you know, it depends on who's in power, whether the enforcement side is really pushed or whether the consultation side is really pushed or whether the whistleblower part of OSHA is, is really pushed. That's the, you know, violation of people's working rights and stuff like that. Um, and so, in, in this ad, in current administration, it's been more of an enforcement push and a lot of whistleblower um, push. Um, but back to what I'm saying, we have a lot of leeway. And so we can adjust things like penalties and things like that. And in, in general, we, we have some of the lowest um, penalties in the country. Now, um, the, the federal folks have been kind of honest in the last few years to say, you know, you need to get your penalties up, you need to get your penalties up. And what we ask them is, good, show us something, a study that shows that higher penalties um, equal lower um, incident rates of, of injuries and illnesses. And they have not brought that study forth to us yet. So um, I think we have a pretty good case that says we, you know, in South Carolina, we like to see the money go toward safety rather than um, penalties into the state coffer because we don't see any of it. OSHA does not see any of it per se. It goes into the general fund, just like, you know, everything else goes into it. Um, and so our, our, you know, we believe in strong penalties for those companies who just fail to, you know, get it done after, you know, a couple of visits from OSHA or they have, you know, many repeat violations. We go back, you know, several times, you know, the enforcement folks do, and they just don't, they just don't correct stuff, you know. That's when, you know, we can lay the heavy penalties on them and, and, and when we, you know, we, we can do that if we want. Um, but in, in general for, you know, employers who are, are trying hard and stuff like that, we, we don't try to kill them with the penalties. You know, of course, there's always going to be a penalty, um, but um, they're a little less than what, a lot less than what the, the feds do. And um, that's, that's just our, our philosophy in this state. Um, so that's the way the penalty system works. And also, you know, in other things, um, <clears throat> we can have differences in, in laws. Our laws can be stricter um, if we want them to. California, Oregon, Washington State, um, they have a lot, a lot of their OSHA rules and regulations are more strict than the, the federal OSHA laws are. So there's a lot of differences between um, state plan states and federally run states um, in that regard. Um, I am, um, just to, to um, speak on what Harvey's talking about, um, I met Harvey a couple years ago and OSHA showed up at our doorstep and so we have the deer in the headlight look, right? And um, and and that's when we call our attorney. Actually, <laughs> not. I would. 
Absolutely. Um, but, um, and we went through the audit process, um, and, and it, was, it was a challenging process. It was a painful process on the compliance side. Um, but I will say, and I'm not saying it's just because, because Harvey's here, um, it's part of why I wanted you to join the panel today, is, um, is because after the audit was complete and after we received our penalties, um, we wanted to partner on the cooperative side um, and we wanted to fix, um, fix our, our areas. And, and the tone changed once we, we started talking with Harvey's team. Um, and it was like talking with two different groups. Um, but he helped us significantly um, uh, with, I mean, we went through several variations of audits, or not audits, um, of um, creating a safety checklist and various things, which I've shared with a couple of you. Um, but I mean, our, um, we, it was a very collaborative process, and, and our penalties were, were significantly <coughs> reduced, but we also had a good faith effort. Um, we were trying to, to uh, it was the first audit we had ever. Um, but how many of you have had a surprise audit from, from OSHA? Okay, so you know that deer in headlights look and pick up some call of tree or whoever you're trying to <laughs> um, I think that's, um, I think sometimes, I mean, on, when I was in the field, I was fearful of, gosh, if I, I partner with OSHA, if I call OSHA, I'm on their radar, right? Um, and that's not necessarily the case. I mean, if you, if you contact the voluntary side, they have no communication with the compliance side. So you're not on a radar. Um, and it was something that if I could do over again, I would partner on the voluntary side because it does, it, there's not, it's not really, um, there's a perception of fear. And if I, if I could do it over, I, I would. Um, so Harvey, you, you started on the compliance side yeah. and then you moved to, vol to voluntary side. Mm -hmm. So can you walk through um, just the differences, the main differences between compliance and the voluntary side of our show? Sure. Um, well, of course, compliance is not voluntary. Um, they, uh, compliance will come in for one of several reasons. The first being um, they have what they call their, their scheduled inspections. Those are the ones that there's, you know, lists of, of you know, industry codes that have the highest injury and illness rates and, and, uh, and other means by which we, you know, they, they pick people to inspect. And then they, they will just go down. Um, in that list of, of companies and, and pick companies at random and they go up to your door and say, hello, I'm from OSHA, I'm here to help you. And, um, they don't say that. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> They're supposed to say Just that. Just a clarification. They are supposed to say that. Um, and, and when they come, you know, they have the, the right to inspect the workplace. You have the right to refuse them. Um, but then they can, you know, go and get an administrative warrant to try to get, you know, entry to the premises and all that. And it's, it's, it's a back and forth kind of thing sometimes. But generally they will get in. Um, so that's, that's one way they go. Another way they go is um, from a complaint, an employee complaint um, about an unsafe, um, you know, condition at the site. And they can go in for that. Um, they can also go in for if you've had um, a fatality. They will, they will always go in for a fatality. Unless it's, um, they may not go visit the site, but they will certainly contact you in the case where it might be a heart attack or something like that, something non-work related. They will normally contact you and ask you, you know, when, uh, for the coroner's report, you know, we'll get the coroner's report when it comes back if, if it's, you know, whatever. But anyway, they'll come in for a fatality. And um, they will also come in for, uh, you know, if they see something in the paper, you know, well, amputations now you have to report. So they'll, they'll, they might or might not come out for an amputation depending on the seriousness of that. Um, but even, a, you know, a hospitalization or, or something they read about in the newspaper, you know, if there was a fire there, even a minor fire or, you know, an explosion that maybe didn't hurt anybody, but they see that in the paper and that's enough um, legal, you know, status for them to say, there may be conditions here that are not compliant with OSHA rules and regulations. So that's kind of what they, they need that before they, they go on to a site. And they use, that's why they use the high hazard rates and all that kind of thing to, to kind of get into these um, places. But so they are the enforcement side. They are the policemen. Okay, they're going to go in and they're going to look at your site and they're going to find citations. I guarantee it, you know, nine times out of ten, you're not going to come out clean. Um, but 
they will find the citations. You'll be assessed a certain amount of money and required to, you know, correct any of the of the hazards that they find. Um, you can always contest, you know, those citations, um, or um, you can go um, call uh, Carl Maddox. Um, and I, I have some cards up here with numbers on them, and Carl's with the informal conference um, manager, so. Sometimes through that process, you can you, you can work some things out. Um, you know, if you have a question about a citation, or maybe you know you don't think the citation is is proper, sometimes Carl can work that out before it has to go to court. Um, but you have the right to to do that, and that'll be um, you know you'll you'll go to court, and the uh, law judge will tell you whether it's you know whether you win or whether OSHA wins. Um, so, and, but that is the compliance side. Uh, the consultation side is more of a cooperative thing. We were, we were set up um, right at the beginning of OSHA, and every state has a consultation program. They, they all call themselves something different. Um, in Alabama, they're called Safe State. You know, here we call it OSHA Voluntary Programs. Um, so they all have their, you know, their names that are, attractive to people and then make them think, you know, that we're, you know, a good company to work or a good um, organization to work with. But we were tasked early on, um, small employers, when OSHA first came out under the Nixon administration, they said, you know, these regulations are, are onerous for us. I, you know, we do not have um, the money to hire somebody to, you know, know all these laws and to come in compliance with them. So the federal government said, all right, we're going to fund these um, organizations within the states that can help small employers come into compliance before OSHA gets there. And that was the, the consultation group. They give me 90%, the federal folks give me 90% of my money and 10% comes from the state. So a large portion of my funding comes from the federal government. Um, and we're tasked with helping small employers come into compliance. Um, we are separate from the enforcement division. In some states, if, if it's a federally run state, Normally, they are run out of a university, the consultation groups are. University of Alabama, University of South Florida, Mississippi State University, this is in Region 4. Um, so, or, and in the state-run states, they're usually run out of a governmental organization, um, you know, a part of the state government. And that's the way it is here in South Carolina. Um, and in North Carolina, it's the same thing. So, um, we we'll go out to a site and we will assist a company in coming into compliance with OSHA rules and regulations. We do what we call a um, consultation, you know, walkthrough, and it's a, a lot like a compliance audit. You know, we'll look at all your paperwork, make sure you have the proper, um, you know, forms and paperwork filled out. Uh, we will go through your site and look for hazards, um, machine guarding. We will do, um, one good thing we can do for small companies is actually do um, monitoring, uh, monitoring for air contaminants, monitoring for noise contaminants. That's an expensive proposition if any of you have ever had it done. You know, if you're a small company, it can, it can run into the thousands of dollars, and we do that for free. All of our services are for free. Um, and then we, we send a report, a written report, back to the uh, employer stating what we found and giving them some suggestions on how to correct it. And where we're different from compliance in that regard is we will work with you in trying to get things corrected. You know, compliance just tells you this is what we found, correct it. And we will actually sit there with you and, and come up with ideas. And my guys have a lot of experience. They've seen things corrected in a lot of ways. And we can usually find, you know, if money's an issue, we can usually find a less expensive way to correct it and still make it a, a really good, solid, you know, correction of the hazard, not just a you know, a Band-Aid over it. Um, and we also have other areas within consultation. Oh, one thing I need to tell you is, is, is as she mentioned, um, we are confidential from OSHA. Um, OSHA does, cannot look at our reports. They cannot use our, their, our reports um, in anything they do to prove a citation or anything like that. They, they can never look at them. Um, also, we have fought and one most of the time um, FOIA requests for our files. So if somebody, you know, 
does a FOIA request on our files, um, that is prohibited by federal law. Um, sometimes we do get, uh, you know, what's the legal term for it, when the judge, a subpoena, yes, a subpoena. And we try to fight those subpoenas. We do. Sometimes we lose. And when we lose, I, you know, hand over the stuff because I don't want to go to jail. But um, That's probably it's, it's, it's extremely yeah. rare. It's extremely rare. Um, and so it's, it's confidential. We don't tell them that we're there. They don't know we're there, which sometimes leads to circumstances that make people suspicious. In other words, you know, we're on a site and, you know, three days later, OSHA shows up on the site. You know, and they say, oh, well, you know, consultation told them, well, that, that's not the case. That's not the case. They just, you, you just came up on their, you know, radar um, at that particular time. Now, the good thing about consultation is while you're working with us, you are exempt from any OSHA programmed inspection. It doesn't let you out if it's fatality or, you know, a catastrophe or a complaint. They still have to come on site. Um, and our, our, our um, inspection at that point will be backed off until they're done. But if it's just their general inspection, um, you are immune from those until you are finished with us completely. In other words, we are off site. You have corrected all the hazards. You have written back to us that you've corrected the hazards. And then they can go in if they want to, although they don't know when we finish. So, I, you know, it's, it's hit or miss for them, too. Um, so, yeah. pre so previously, if I chose to partner with you on the voluntary side before compliance came in, then, um, you know, when they showed up on my doorstep, I could have just called you and say, listen, compliance is here. How do we work through this? And then they, at that point, could not enter our site. Correct. It, assuming there was no fatality. Assuming it was just a, just a general visit. Right. Um, that, is, that is correct. They, they, they would not go on the site unless it was something besides a, you know, a programmed inspection. That's a plus. It is. It's a huge, it is. And, huge and, and, and the deferral um, starts, you know, we can't get to everybody the same week. So um, our, our compliance area in South Carolina, which is another reason to have a state plan state, has given us a, a kind of a 60-day window before the inspection starts. So if you call in to us and say, you know, I want you to come out, and we say, well, we can get to you in, you know, 45 days. During that 45 days, if compliance would happen to come on site, you would tell them, look, I have a scheduled, you know, visit with, uh, you know, the OSHA voluntary programs. They would call me to confirm it. The compliance folks would call me to confirm that indeed, yes. And at that point, you know, the confidentiality kind of goes out the door, I'm sorry to say, but we've got to confirm it somehow, otherwise people would just, you know, abuse it. So they call me and I tell them, the only thing I tell them is, yes, we are working with them. Okay. And then they, they will pull out. So that's the only thing they learn about it. They don't know how much we're working or what we're doing or anything like that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have, uh, so Rainey um, is with us from Zia. And, um, and Rainey's been, he's worked with OSHA for over 20 years in creating the infrastructure for uh, voluntary sites with Milliken. Um And so you've, you've implemented actually over, I think it was 46 sites, 46 of APC sites. Um, and Milliken was one of the first organizations that, that um, implemented a voluntary site um, within South Carolina. So with um, in spending so much of, of your time implementing sites, there's, there's value that you see in this program. So help us understand um, just with your experience in partnering with BPP, the value of, um, of partnering on, uh, on Harvey's side of the organization. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be here with you. You know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was that it, there's an element of fear when OSHA <laughs> shows up at the doorstep. Uh, what VPP does is it moves that word from fear to probably clear because you're you're uh, okay with something like that to take place because you know your infrastructure is there. You're never perfect. No, no person, no site, no company is, but you're prepared and, and you're well prepared uh, in that process. Uh, there is a British standard now that's very popular um, called OSHA 18001, and that is the safety standard that. Um, is used similar to what ISO does for ISO 9000, ISO uh, standards that we have. There's a 14001 environmental standard. <clears throat> OSHAS 18001 is the safety standard. 
because there is no, today, there is no ISO standard for safety. ISO 45001 will be something that will be transcending um, a few years down the road. Um, we are, within ZF now, all of our sites are, are getting ready to go underneath the OSHAS 18001 certification process. And it's a worldwide, it's a British standard, so it's a worldwide standard too. The thing that, um, as we prepare for that, the thing that, that I am most pleased with as we look at um, right now around 30 sites that we have in the U.S. and Mexico as well, is that we put in the infrastructure uh, for those sites identical to what we have been installing underneath the VPP standard. Uh, VPP standard is a more rigid standard, if you would, than 18001. And by rigid, I don't mean extremely tough, I mean a better process than that. It really, really helps you reduce injuries. It helps you become a world-class operation. It helps you move certainly beyond just that of compliance. Because if you look at a safety system, um, a safety process in a location in a company, you find that, that companies are trying to get to maybe just that mode of being in compliance. And you move from a compliance mode, if you have that infrastructure and that foundation in place, you move from a, a compliance standard or a compliance way of life, if you would, to preventive safety. And that means that you have your employees involved, you, you're doing the things, you're above just the standard. And that's what VPP uh, wants you to be, and that's above standard. There's another level actually above that that we're beginning to work on in CF, and it'll be an evolutionary process over the next four to five years before we move into preventive safety. And that's a level beyond um, uh, having an involvement. That means that you try to predict where things will occur and you try to put parameters in place to keep injuries from happening before that situation ever arises. Uh, it's a different dynamic, if you would, than, than what we typically live in. But I think, in, in going back to your question, the thing that, that um, I've seen for many, many years, and when, we came, when I came into ZF and some other companies, I used that same process, that same infrastructure, that same uh, set of dynamics that we uh, implemented in Millican a few years ago in, in sending those slides through BBP. We still use those same standards. And, and that happened in the early, we were talking a few minutes ago, in the early mid-90s. That same standard we're putting in locations today in ZF throughout the U.S. and Mexico. And, and I've been, over the last uh, six months, I've been in Shanghai, China. I've been in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I've been in Agar, Hungary, and some of the locations that ZF has. We have right now 300 companies, 300 locations worldwide. And we're putting that same infrastructure in place there. Uh, and it just works. It just works. Uh, not only does it help reduce injuries, uh, but it gives you much better resolve, and you're almost kind of not looking forward to an ocean inspection <laughs> necessarily, <laughs> but you're ready for it, because, and you're anticipating that. And, and when they come, you say, great, let me show you what I have. Let me show you the system. Let me show you the process for lockout, tagout, <clears throat> for hearing conservation, for emergency preparedness, whatever the program may be. Let me show you this. And by the way, anything that you can see that we can get better on, we're certainly open to that as well. And so you're anticipative. You're not, uh, you're not in a very condescending mode when something like that happens. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a great program. I, can't, I can't, certainly can't uh, say enough about it. I think ZF just bought, uh, purchased TRW. TRW is an American company. ZF is a German company. We're based out of Friedrichshafen, German, uh, Germany. Uh, OSHA doesn't exist in Germany. Uh, and so we're setting the standard now for, in region North America, for our sites in the U.S. and Mexico, we're setting the standard using the same VPP dynamics in a lot of other uh, facilities throughout the world, and we're getting them ingrained. I hope, and it's my vision, in the next five to seven years that we will move into the VPP process, and we will begin to interface with that um, as we have locations. MyOSHA, for example, we have several facilities in Michigan. It's run by MyOSHA, which is a, a state-run plan. I'm from Georgia, so we are a federal plan underneath that. But the parameters of VPP are, are, are transparent throughout the whole process. And so uh, some, some um, in the audience may, may be asking themselves, what kind of time commitment is required? What kind of resources are required? Um, and is it, um, so can you speak to that as far as the, the, um, the level of, of commitment that's required? And, and also with Millican, 
had someone in leadership who said, we, we're going to do this, and so you follow that. What if you don't have, you know that it's needed, but you don't have someone who's, who's, like, who's a senior member of the management team that, that is supporting you? How do you face that challenge? Certainly. Uh, that's a good question. There's a level of commitment. Uh, there's a level of time. There is a lesser element of money, but, but there is some there um, because if, if uh, the VPP group comes in and finds something that you need to work on, then the expectation is that you would correct that. And, and they won't cite you for it. They'll give you a window of time to correct it. That's a plus, certainly, for, for companies. So there is a, definitely an element of time and an element of, of process in getting this, uh, the system set up. But I would rather be working on that side than on the other side of the fence. I would rather be working on that than just trying to dig out from some hole somewhere or position somebody from being injured, uh, inside that process. So, so it's there. One of the interesting things, um, it's not a requirement that a location or a company have this huge plethora of EHS professionals to implement BPP. That's not a requirement inside Millican and Company. Millican had in its heyday 91 locations in the in the southeast. There was no EHS coordinator, no EHS manager at any site. It was just underneath the responsibilities of the human resources department. So there was not a quote full-time person designated just to do environmental health and safety. Uh, but it got done. It, it just got done. In most sites you see now, there is at least one EHS professional. Typically, they fall under HR. They can fall under manufacturing or maintenance, but typically they're under HR. So there is no parameter or requirement that you have to have a huge staff. It does require time. It does require time. But in my role as, as supporting many locations uh, in the U.S. and in Mexico, and now soon to be Canada as well, when we do internal audits, we have an internal audit system that we do that's as rigid or more rigid than we would find in EPP because it's helping us get ready for that. Um, when we do those internal audits and things, um, it's very, very um, methodical. So everything is set up. So if we ask a question about um, machine guarding, if we ask about lockout, tagout, if we ask about whatever um, um, bloodborne pathogen standard, whatever it may be, everything within the sites are all laid out. There is a process where that EHS professional would, would have something in front of them so that if an ocean inspector come to visit your site and ask if, if history says that machine guarding or electrical safety is where more injuries are occurring, and that's the reason why they would come to visit, and they come into a facility and ask, could they look at your electrical safety standard? You have everything that you need and should have ready for electrical safety right there at your disposal. Because typically what you'll have is, is you'll have an ocean inspector come in and they'll say, hey, we're here to look at your electrical safety standard. And you, being a representative of the company, would say, that's great. Now, I think our maintenance manager has some of the records, and you know he's on vacation this week. Holy smokes. Uh, if you'll have a seat right there, let me go see if I can gather a few things together. Now, um, yeah, yeah there, are some, there are some things on, my goodness, where in the world are those inspections for the forklift trucks? I think they're somewhere. I think the shift supervisors have them, and I'll have to get. That's usually what you run into, and that's usually what they see. So if you were an ocean inspector and you saw that, what would you think? Organized or not? Systems in place or not? Prepared to reduce injuries or keep injuries from happening or not? So if you have BPP in place, if you have the infrastructure in place, you're actually are anticipating that and you say, I'm glad you're here. Let me show you what I've got. And everything is laid out. Here's your program. Here's how you train people. Here are the metrics you do. Here's how things are going on. Here's the processes you have. It's all right there. And it just really makes life easier. My top 10 hit or top 10 um, things for surviving an ocean inspection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have all your paperwork, know where it is, keep it updated. Absolutely. And be able to give it to that inspector immediately. He's going to say, you got it. And if, if they come in for a general inspection and they ask about lockout, tagout, and then they ask about hearing conservation, and then they ask about whatever standard you've got, uh, forklift powered industrial trucks, after you show them and it's very well oiled, then they'll say, well, okay, then um, let's just move on to something else, you know, because your act is together. It does take work up front to do that. But the maintenance of that program year in and year out is so much easier than having to re the wheel every time. Thank you. Um, 
something that you mentioned, um, just the resources that are available at your fingertips. I remember that um, when I was with my previous employer, I um, worked with a, um, a safety consulting group, and they helped with the confined space program. And it cost a lot of money. I mean, it was very expensive. And what I wish I would have done is, is partnered with OSHA because you, you, you helped with, with confined space programs. You helped with fall protection, lockout, tagout programs, um, has come. So that's available to all of us um, without without having to pay for it. Um, yeah, well, it's paid for. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I said, oh. yeah, it's paid for. It. This for good reason. Good reason. Um, so what I'd like to do is is um, is pass the, the mic to Phil. Um, so you're currently with um, you're with you're with Honeywell, and um, and you're currently um, under the, the uh, VPP program as well. Right. And um, you all recently went through a recertification. Last year, 2004. Right. right. So can I preface something? Yeah. I, I want to validate your point about uh, using your services. For 25 years in safety, I've used your services for numbers, number of times. Never had any problem and very professional. The, the feedback I've got was just excellent. So, and it's not just because he's here either. So, um, but uh, your services has been excellent. So, I would encourage you guys to use that, use the resources. Uh, I've used IH, um, the safety audits, all that. So, and it's been very, very helpful. So, just a background for at Honeywell. Um, before I get into, I just want to show you. I'm, I'm peeling back the curtain on some of these uh, things that we talked about here. And I'm going to show you our dirty laundry, if you will. But, um, but prior to coming to Honeywell, I was at another company, and a Honeywell executive became a CEO. So um, he wanted to implement some of the management systems that we've talked about here at the, the, that employer I was working at. I had 22 sites as a safety director, and I wanted to implement some of those things. So I went to Honeywell to benchmark their management processes. So after we, after we implemented that, sorry about that, uh, after we implemented that, I liked Honeywell's processes so much, I took a job with Honeywell. So, so I, I moved over there, but Honeywell's safety program has not been all that, uh, all that great. And I, I just want to show you, and Harvey can talk a little bit about that. Just a, we do helicopter blades and uh, jet engines and all that, just to, to show you. So we have 500 employees here. Um, a lot of Army stuff with Bonza, Swiss Air, a lot of those things that we do there. But uh, what I wanted to show you here is uh, uh, one of Harvey's uh, main uh, employees. Get back. Which way are you trying to get to, Bill? Uh, the second, third slide. Oh, should we go back? Sorry, I'll go yeah. back. Sorry. So um, this is just a statement here. One more slide. Uh, Sharon Dubin works for a volunteer protection agency there. This is what they said in 2007 about Honeywell. <laughs> we didn't get it. So um, it really put into motion a lot of the things that we needed to set in, uh, set in place. So uh, what happened after that was a concerted effort. It's a collective All right, sorry. Maybe you can just it's, it's it's all good. Good. Yeah. 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 so in uh, Harvey signs the paperwork right you, yeah so you can remember back in 2007 I, I've been there you're so okay so <laughs> we didn't have a good reputation with OSHA because we let our BPP program slip and my really talk is basically sustainability so we, we put into place a, a steering committee for VPP and uh, set into motion a lot of the key components of VPP in there. So you can just kind of move through. I'm just going to go through these slides just really quickly. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the focus was on management and leadership in this process. So we, we had some brainstorming ideas, got uh, together, safety audits, uh, did a lot of stuff engaging the employees. You can move to the next slide. Personal action plans. We really, we, we really focused on a lot of things that the management team did. <laughs> Yeah, okay. you can just, and really was it about education and engaging there. So here's our, here's our dirty laundry here. So we started in 2007 at a 2.8, and uh, right now we're at, uh, right now, knock on wood, 
we're at a zero. So um, it's it's been uh, it's this has really been a hard journey, and it's and again it's all about sustainability. Uh, that's our loss, a lost time case. We had one last year, but uh, we still have a downward trend on that. It's been, again, a been very much a challenge of the past eight years. This is our employee relations survey. Um, we consistently, for the last few years, we have been uh, hitting our safe environment in response to HSE issues as one of our top employee relations issues. And again, it's all because of VPP and a lot of the things that we've got behind there. So again, really hitting that hard. We just got our 2015 survey and it's still on top. So this is how we maintain our system. Uh, all the things that are around that is focused on 5S, tier meetings, uh, visual management, process flow. All these things help sustain our management system and keeping our VPP up to, uh, up to date there. The accountability. So really this is what the heart of it. When I first came to Honeywell, I couldn't stand this because I wasn't used to all these tier meetings and accountability. But as I got used to it, we have like several uh, tier meetings on a daily basis that holds our site accountable to safety. The first topic that we have on a daily basis is safety. We talk about production and everything, and it, all, it escalates all the way to the manager meeting, which I attend every day. And we have to have somebody at that meeting to address safety issues as we go through. This is our uh, VPP elements as, as aligned with our management system. So again, if you guys want to see some of this in more detail, visit us. Um, as part of the VPP, we have to mentor other sites. So if you want to come to our site, see some of these key details of what we do, please see me after this meeting here. But this is the alignment there. Another key thing is CIs. Continuous improvement is so important to VPP. We have a CI system where we ask each employee to have two, two CIs a month. And they submit those, and we recognize employees at our town halls, our communication, and we also give what we call bravos, money to our employees to, to submit safety. We have safety topics on a day-to-day -day basis to, to keep that um, focus on safety. Every day we have that safety. We involved in uh, the key VPP regional conferences uh, on an annual basis. Um, we also have a lot of employee safety fairs and other things to kind of engage our employees uh, in safety and health. And uh, again, uh, we do mentoring programs as well with other sites. And um, a few other ones there. I do want to highlight that last uh, thing. This is one of our, I, I really like this, and I wanted to highlight this, one of our CIs from employees. Working in conjunction with engineering, we had some grinding issues there at the site. And uh, they engineered a wonderful, you can go into the next uh, slide there, a tool that we highlighted in our last VPP. So this is just one example of employees that really uh, contributed to the safety of our, uh, uh, of our site. So a lot of engagement. I, I went really quickly through that, but I wanted to kind of give you some, some kind of a, a broad sweep of what we're doing at uh, Honeywell. And again, I came to Honeywell because I knew that their safety was really on the top, top priority. We have other corporate systems that keeps us accountable, corporate safety audits, uh, self-assessment, um, we, and we paste, we also have the weekly meetings with our corporate staff as well. So a lot of good systems that have got a good approaches, but it didn't start. It's, we were on the bottom, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so sustainability is really the only one that's um, get back now. Yeah. And we tell our VPP sites first, you know, on the first time they get into the program is now the hard work starts. Because, you know, when you're building toward it, it's, it's all fun, you know, it's, it's, oh yeah, you know, new challenges and all this kind of stuff. And then like anything else, it's, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to lose weight and losing weight's easy, but staying there once you get there is hard, you know, so, um, it, it's kind of like that, and um, a couple things I, I do want to say about VPP is, um, although they, they, the VPP sites are exempted from OSHA um, general inspections, you know, the program inspections, I don't know one site that gives a hoot about getting inspected by OSHA, because they are ready for it. That's not the reason they are in the VPP program. If it were, they wouldn't be in the VPP program. They're just looking for an exemption from OSHA. Believe me, it's not worth the money and the time to do it because it's a lot of work. Um, and it's just, just easier to take that OSHA inspection every five years, probably. I would, you know, truly it is. Um, but they do it because 
of the benefits of, of the BPP program. And the other thing is I, I have yet to see a BPP site that doesn't have a total commitment in all tiers of their company, from the management to the employees. In, in many of these companies, you know, the employees are, are really the ones who are running the safety program. You can't you can't do it any other way. You can't have you can't have three guys on a site looking for all the hazards and running the programs. It's just not going to work. You've got to have everybody looking for hazards. You've got to have everybody involved. Maybe not every single person, but you know every 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 strata of your company. You know, and some some people from employee you know the employee or associates you know if you call them that um, area. Some people from middle management. Some people from top management. And as in Milliken. Um, you know, the driving force there was <coughs> Milliken wanted it done. And at that point, there was nobody higher than him. And if he wanted it done, it got done. And I remember them saying, and when, when you meant, went to meet, you know, on your, on your monthly meeting or, or biannual meeting with, with Mr. Milliken, it was, first thing he talked about was safety. First thing. And, and every week, what's your safety record? How are you doing safety? So that's where it starts. People will do what the boss wants, or people will do what the boss checks you on. Let me say that. If you're getting checked on it every week, that's what you're going to focus on. The stuff you're not getting checked on, you're not going to focus on. So that accountability is important. Yeah. Um, we talked um, about a lot of stuff this morning. Um, do we have any questions, whether it be anyone who's, who's dialed in or anyone here? Yes. Yeah. Question for Randy, because I know you've been through so many facilities. Some of, the, some of the customers we work with are older facilities, older technology and equipment. And typically they oftentimes become like a loss leader facility. So they're making low profit, low profit products. Morale's low and money's low. How, how do you deal and, and energize a facility like that from a safety standpoint? Yeah, um, a couple of points. Um, there was a statistic several years ago that came out of, uh, came out of actually came out of OSHA that said 94% of the injuries in America's workplace is a result of the actions of people. So that's a good place to start in looking at how people, it, we have to equip them to work safely. We have to train them. We have to make sure the machine guards and those kind of things in place. But, but the actions of people and the audit systems that, that you do for those kind of things is, is critically important. Um, I, I'm a firm believer, and I, I truly am, if, if everyone in this room was challenged with, with going to an operation somewhere in Greenville County that um, was a, a disaster waiting to happen, and you wanted to really instill into that workplace an opportunity to be successful, you do that first with safety, because that's where your employees can see that you care and that you're committed. Safe, quality is critically important. Logistics is critically important. Financial aspirations are critically important, but you can see the safety stuff. You can see that you care. You can see that you have intensity. If there's an injury that occurs on a machine or around an area, um, who's there and how quickly are you there and how fast do you take care of that injury? A lot of those things going into it. Uh, Nate, there is some money things in, in, inside there. there. I mean, uh, you know, there are some things, but there's also things that you can do that we talked about earlier that would negate it being uh, extremely expensive to do. But there are some things that are a little costly. Right now, one of the things that, that is there is arc flash safety, and that's something that's out there, and it's something that, that um, a lot of companies are, are working on uh, now, and that does require uh, some advanced costs when you look typically at upgrading uh, your panels and things like that from an arc flash standpoint. But a lot of things do not. A lot of things are just behavioral-based things. So. Can I answer that question real quick, too? Uh, I find that some of the small things, such as a 5S program, building a foundation of organizational uh, stability in terms of that makes employees proud to work there and really instituting something that just cleans up the place because a lot of safety issues are housekeeping issues. And if you don't build that foundation or pride, and, and with, the, with supervisors as well, the leadership aspect too, because if you don't have a good leadership system, no matter what size you are, you know, then you're going to have safety issues and not resolve those things. It, it, to to, to uh, compound on what he's saying, we know in regional North America clearly that 
um, we track all the data. We track all the work hours. We track all the injuries. We track all the first aids. We track all the recordables. We know the areas of the body. We know the positions. We know all that data. So clearly it tells us that we have opportunities in the ergonomics arena. We just do. So what is what can you do to help uh, dissipate the injuries from an ergonomic standpoint? We have, as I'm sure you and all other companies have, we have ZF. PS, just like Toyota production systems and Bosch production systems, they're all uh, cookie cutter type type operations. And the first thing we do when we do lean manufacturing workshops, we'll go into a work sale, we pull these people away for three or four days, and we, we just totally begin to break that work sale down. We teach them things, we, but the first thing we do is safety. We teach them that. They have safety enveloped around that whole parameter as we begin to redesign that workstation uh, so that it not only can reduce tack times and those kind of things that we have to do to, to, to stay in business, but also what do you do to reduce CTDs and those kind of things as well. And, and it, it's amazing what that group of people, but again, you're involving your people. It's, it's a behavioral-based thing, and it's amazing how more efficient in any parameter that you look at a work sale once that's done. Yes, for um, we have two programs. One is is the VPP, um, and that's for your larger companies, but small companies can do it also. Um, and then we have the SHARP program, the uh, um, Safety and Health Assistance Recognition Program, Achievement Recognition Program, um, and that is um, it's targeted towards small employers, um, and in fact is limited to small employers, 250 or less, or 500 nationwide company size um, or less. Um, and both of those, um, the VPP requires, really the first thing to do is to contact us um, in South Carolina. Now in other states it might be different. Um, but the first thing to do is to contact us and I will put you in touch with Sharon Dumit. Sharon will come out to your site, spend a day with you, look over everything, see where you are in that process. Um, you know, what kind of time frame we're looking at, what kinds of things you're gonna have to do um, before you even put in your application. You know, sometimes you have two two years of work ahead of you before you know you even should bother to put in your application. And then at that point, um, you you put in the application, and Sharon will walk you through that too. Um, and then you know they set a, a date to come out for the visit, and they come out and um, you know do the do the review, and you are approved or you're not approved. And it's it's gone both ways, you know, for us. Um, we've had some sites that we've gone to and they haven't been approved and, and um, some sites we've gone to that they have been approved. Sharon really tries to make sure they're ready before we go out um, so there's not that, you know, negative thing that happens, so, you know, you got to work on this or that. Um, for Sharp, it's, it's a lot easier. All you have to do is put in a request for um, consultation, full health and safety consultation, and when they come out, they will also look at your safety and health system. We have a a form we have to fill out and, and rate you on your safety and health system. And if that is good and if, you know, the hazards are, are corrected and all that, um, and your numbers, of course, you know, your injury and illness rates um, are, are low enough, then you get into SHARP. And both of those are deferral from um, OSHA general inspection programs. So really the first thing for you to do is just to contact my office. All right. Um, Burning questions before we wrap up. Um, but we're going to stay around. So if you have additional questions, if you want to speak with, with one of the one of the guys one on one, no problem. Um, but um, we we get these topics from you. Um, so you know, I spoke with um, several clients and um, some potential clients who kept bringing up safety. And um, I the last person I spoke with about this, actually, I was visiting Jack at his site. And after he mentioned, I said, you know what, I've heard this from so many people. I got on the phone that day and, um, and spoke with Harvey. So if, um, if you have topics that you want us to speak on, um, we do this once a month, so we'd love to, to get your feedback. Um, and we just really appreciate your time today. So thank you. And if, if you have any questions about OSHA, you know, you hear a lot of rumors about OSHA. Oh, this is happening, that's happening, whatever. Um, 
I encourage you if there's a rumor out there and it just sounds ridiculous, it probably is, but give our office a call. Um, either I can answer it or I can put you in touch with our standards folks who are not in the enforcement area. Um, and they can, um, you know, look at standards issues for you if you don't understand a standard um, or want an interpretation of a standard, um, they can help you with that. Because sometimes the standards aren't easy to read and they're interpreted differently from what you might think. So. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate each of you joining us. And everybody who's online or in the audience, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.